Hey guys, today we're going to be covering chapter 27. So we're going to be going over um, the trauma patient as well as what the trauma system is. Just a quick uh, overview of it. <coughs> Excuse me. In this chapter, we'll go over what the kinetics of trauma is, how do we determine a mechanism of injury. We'll go over how to treat a multi-system trauma patient, um, the golden principles, as well as what the golden period and the platinum 10 minutes is. So trauma makes up a very large, a significant portion of the calls that we go to. Um, whether it is due to a fall, motor vehicle accident, assault, shooting, whatever. So we want to be able to recognize, based off of what it was that caused the trauma, the extent of the injury that is possible, so that we can make sure, those, make sure that we make those critical decisions that could potentially save that person's life. Now, how severely a person is injured depends on the amount of force with which they collide with something or something collides with him. This force depends partly on the energy contained within the moving body or bodies. The energy contained in a moving body is called the kinetic energy. Now, when you hear the term mechanism of injury, this is how a person is injured. Um, and a lot of times you can get this MOI based off of what you were dispatched as. Just like you get your nature of illness from dispatch, you can get your MOI, such as a fall. The MOI is a fall. So by being able to understand that, being able to understand the science behind it or the kinetics, this can help you try to figure out exactly what potential injuries you might be dealing with. Now, kinetic energy, to figure out how much it, what it is, kinetic energy in a moving body is calculated in this way. The mass in weight in pounds times the velocity or speed in feet per second squared divided by 2. Okay, so in other words, let me get my pen. Let's say you have a 200-pound man. 200 pounds times we'll say they fall at say they're falling at 6 feet per second okay so that's 6 I'm just going to put 6 I'm not going to put out feet per second okay squared divided by 2 then you just go through the math 6 squared it's 36, so now we have 200 times 36 divided by 2, okay, which that gives you, coming down here, 7200 divided by 2. Then you do your division. So that leaves us with thirty six hundred pounds per square feet. Okay. All right, so that formula illustrates that as the mass of a moving object is doubled, its kinetic energy is also doubled. So in other words, you would be injured twice as badly if you were hit by a two-pound rock as if you were hit by a one-pound rock thrown at the same speed. Now, velocity is a much more significant factor than mass. Suppose you're hit by a rock thrown at a velocity of one foot per second and then hit by the same rock thrown again at two feet per second. The rock thrown at two feet per second would not be twice as harmful as at one foot per second, but in actuality would be four times as, har as harmful because the factor of velocity is squared. Now understanding this factor of velocity is important in evaluating mechanism of injury in vehicle collisions. 
During your scene size up as you try to get an idea of how seriously vehicle passengers may have been injured, it's important to estimate the speed of the vehicle or vehicles at the time of the collision, knowing that a high velocity collision will almost certainly have caused greater injuries. Now the rate at which a body in motion increases its speed is known as acceleration. The rate at which a body in motion decreases its speed is known as deceleration. So if one car is braked at a gradual to a, is braked to a gradual stop and the other is stopped suddenly by striking a television pole, the one with the fast rate of deceleration, the one that struck the pole, will be exerting more force. Sorry, went the wrong way. If kinetic energy is transmitted to a human body, continues to travel in a straight line without interruption, injury may not occur. However, energy traveling through the human body is frequently interrupted by the body itself or deflected. So normally, damn it, sorry. my pen here. So normally energy travels, and I know this isn't perfectly straight, straight line. Okay? Well, let's say now this, let's say my straight line is a car. Y'all don't make fun of my art. I know I'm not, no Picasso. Alright? Well, now this car is coming in a straight line, straight for this tree. Well, let's say it hits it at an angle. What do you think is going to happen? Right. That and that car is potentially because this tree ain't going anywhere. Okay. So it's going to be deflected off and go off somewhere this way, um, or that energy, as the car is being crunched into the tree will potentially now that energy is going to go into the patient and that's how that injury occurs. Now there's three different types of impacts within a vehicle collision. You have the vehicle collision, the body collision, and organ collision. By being able to compare the number of impacts it's easy to understand why a person in or on um, a moving vehicle who gets thrown has a much, a much greater chance for injury than one who is restrained or remains in the vehicle. Because each time there's an impact, whether it's a vehicle or an organ collision, there's some type of energy being absorbed. So the very first part, that car coming in, hits that tree. Okay? But it doesn't deflect anywhere, it just stays right there at the tree. And as it goes through it, as you would expect, it gets crunched up. Well, as that energy continues to progress, because all that energy is still coming this way, now that person is coming to a quick stop on something within this inside of the vehicle, such as the steering wheel, causing severe injury to the chest. This is the body collision. Now, as it continues to progress, as soon as that or chest hits, because your body is moving at the same speed as the vehicle. So if your car is going at 70, your body's going at 70. Well, guess what else is going at 70? Your organs. In the organ collision, your internal organs, which are all suspended in their places by tissue, come to a sudden stop. Sudden striking an inside surface of the body, such as the inner chest wall or the inner skull. Well, what happens is once it hits here, now it's being damaged on this side. But let's say there's still energy, then it's going to potentially bounce back and forth until finally that energy is completely dissipated. By having an understanding of mechanisms of injury, you'll be able to arrive on the scene of a vehicle collision and suspect, just simply from looking at the, the, the vehicle damage, what types of traumatic injuries the patient may have experienced. Now it's not going to be accurate, it's just your suspicion. 
Now those type of collisions that should give you a high suspicion and keep that high suspicion is if uh, there's a death within the same vehicle because a force strong enough to kill one person will almost certainly cause severe injuries to other passengers within that compartment. Um, alter mental status. Intrusion of greater than 12 inches into the patient compartment. Or intrusion of at least 18 inches into the engine compartment. Ejection, whether partially or completely. As well as uh, telemetry if that vehicle is uh, compatible. Data from these telemetry systems may provide uh, rest, uh, responders information such as whether the seatbelt was used, the direction of impact, change in velocity. All of this can assist in predicting the severity of the patient's injuries. You may also have a variety of different types of impact, such as a front-end collision, a rotational where it's hit on, the, on one of the uh, corner panels. Lateral is approximately 15%, and rear end collisions are approximately 19% of uh, accidents. In the frontal impact, the driver is continuing to move forward at the same speed the vehicle is traveling. They then proceed to go either up and over the steering wheel, causing injuries potentially to the head, neck, chest, and abdomen, as well as possible ejection through the windshield. Or they may go down and under the steering wheel, causing p injuries potentially to the knees, femurs, hips, pelvis, and spine. With a frontal impact, you want to look for uh, to, uh, indicators that is, can kind of lead you into the type of injuries, <coughs> such as damaged dashboard or deformed steering wheel would cause you to suspect potentially chest and abdominal injuries. Um, in the abdomen, it, it, you have could potentially damage to your solid or hollow organs, such as the liver, spleen, uh, your stomach, your bladder, because these have be, will become compressed between the front and back abdominal walls and spine. Your hollow organs are more easily displaced, leaving your, the solid liver and spleen to bear the brunt of the compression. Within the chest, Bones and soft tissues are affected. Your ribs and sternum could, and cartilage uh, could potentially separate and fracture. A torn intercostal artery can bleed 50 milliliters per minute into the chest cavity with no blood seen externally. Your heart and lungs are the two major organs that are affected with a chest type injury. The heart suffers the effect of two forces, both compression and shear. Compression force occurs when the heart is caught between the sternum and the spine, which can cause a bruise to the heart muscle. The heart is suspended by the aorta, which is attached posteriorly at the arch by a ligament. Shear force tends to pull the aorta at the ligament, which can tear or transect the aorta. The lungs can potentially also be affected. Air trapped within the lungs by sudden closure of the epiglottis is compressed between the ribs and spine. This kind of compression injury is called a paper bag injury because like blowing up a paper bag, then popping it between your hands. You may also have face, head, and neck injuries as the person goes up and over, causing the patient's head to hit the windshield, causing injuries to the soft tissue of the face, as well as causing potential injury to the skull and causing a potential skull fracture. And also, just like how when we were discussing with a with hitting the chest, the uh, organs inside the chest may bounce. The brain may will could potentially uh, bounce it within the skull as well, causing damage to the 
um, to the brain and causing potential cerebral uh, bleeding. Compression of the neck may also cause damage to the musculoskeletal musculature and skeletal f structure of the neck. Patients in a frontal collision who are unrestrained can come in contact with the steering wheel or the dashboard as the airbag deploys. This um, explosive force of the airbag could potentially cause chest injury as well. In that paper bag syndrome, person takes a deep breath, fills up the lungs, epiglottis closed, they hit that chest and it becomes compressed just like a paper bag it pops out the back and now the patient has a ruptured lung causing a severe pneumothorax. With a down and under pathway, in this case you want to look for injuries to the knees, femurs, hips, acetabulum, as well as the spine as they go up and under, or excuse me, down and under the dashboard. Even in the absence of bone injury, the force of the impact can potentially damage the brain. First, the floor of the skull is very rough with many sharp projections. When the brain moves across these projections, it can become lacerated or bruised. Second, the brain can rebound against the opposite side of the skull from the original point of impact. Some other mechanisms of injury that you can see with that frontal impact is as they go forward, it causes a fracture of their hip, dislocated hip or knee as it's hitting the dashboard. If they don't have their belt on and they go forward, they could potentially have a neck injury. If they just have their lap belt on, it'll hold their lap in place, but now they're going straight forward into the dashboard and potentially having a, f a facial injury. With a rear impact, the body is propelled forward by the seat, while the head and neck tend to remain at rest, following the law of inertia. Because the weight of the body exceeds that of the head, the body keeps moving while the head slows. Now, how can you potentially help this and reduce the likelihood of injury? Is having your head rest properly adjusted to where it is directly behind your head. Once the body goes forward, it, will, it could potentially follow the same path, uh, injury pathways as an up and over or a down and under. An improperly positioned headrest that is pushed all the way down to restrain just the neck and not the head can contribute to the severity of the injury by creating a fulcrum against which to bend the neck backwards. If there is a headrest that has been properly positioned and seat belts are worn, injury is now minimized. However, if the vehicle does not have headrests or they are improperly positioned, the neck is then hyperextended and the anterior spinal ligaments are often stretched or torn. This is often referred to as a whiplash injury. As the uh, inertia continues to catch up to the vehicle, the patient is then thrown forward into the dashboard. With a lateral impact, this is where the vehicle has been hit um, on the side of the vehicle. You can have injuries to the head and neck um, because as the energy of the impact is absorbed, the body is pushed laterally or out from underneath the head causing the head to move in the opposite direction of the body. Within the chest and abdomen, you may have injuries because of that lateral strike when the door strikes the side of the chest and abdomen. Um, you may have damage to the shoulder. You may have injury dissipating at the curve in the clavicle, resulting in a fracture of the clavicle. If the arm is caught between the door and chest, or if the door hits the chest, you may have fractures to the ribs and flail segments are possible. Within the pelvis, the impact of the vehicle door to the chest wall also causes a lateral impact to the pelvis. A fracture of the pelvis and upper femur usually complete this pattern. You also want to assess whether the patient bore the brunt of the impact. 
We want to look. Where were they sitting at when the accident occurred? Now, injuries can occur to the head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, and extremities. You need to ask yourself, who took the brunt of that collision? And carefully examine the side of the patient's body that bore the brunt of the lateral impact. With a rotational or rollover crash, the vehicle spins around the point of impact, causing the occupants who are not restrained to strike the mirror posts and doors resulting in many injuries. Both head-on and lateral injury patterns occur. The vehicle hits the ground multiple times and in various places. The occupant changes direction every time the vehicle does. Although a specific pattern of injury is impossible to predict in a rollover, there are a few common characteristics. First, multiple systems injury is common. Second, Ejection is also common if the occupant was not restrained. Finally, crush-type crush injuries to ejected occupants are common as well as they are thrown from the vehicle and the vehicle then rolls over them. During a rollover, the vehicle hits the ground multiple times in multiple places, so you're, it's going to be very hard to determine the extent of the, your MOI. Vehicles with a high center of gravity such as SUVs and vans are also highly prone to rollovers. Following the laws of motion, if you go straight through the windshield into the ditch, so does your vehicle, right of the ditch on top of you. Sometimes patients are thrown into other lanes of traffic too fast for oncoming vehicles to avoid as well. With vehicle pedestrian collisions, the extent of the injury has a variety of um, va uh, variables that it depends on, such as the speed of the vehicle, um, how far they were thrown, the age of the person, what was struck first. The patterns of injury are likely to be different in children than in adults. This is because adults are larger and have a different weight distribution. They also react differently to impending collision. A child who is about to be hit by a vehicle, for example, whether the child is walking or riding a bicycle, generally turns towards the oncoming vehicle. So injuries from the impact are generally to the front of the body. They are then tend to more likely to be thrown from the vehicle and then more likely to be then ran over. As an adult, on the other hand, they usually turn away from the oncoming vehicle, so the most common impact is to the side of the body, and excuse me, and they are more likely then to be thrown over the vehicle versus away from it. Now you may also have some hidden injuries. These occur from the use of restraints within a motor vehicle, including airbags and seat belts. Lap belts, when properly worn, distribute force across the iliac crest of the pelvis. The lap belt prevents the occupant from being ejected, but without a shoulder strap, it does not prevent the chest from striking the steering wheel or the head and neck from striking the dashboard or steering wheel. Compression fractures of the lumbar spine occur as the torso is forcibly flexed forward. If the seatbelt is worn too low, it could potentially dislocate the, t the hips. Shoulder strap worn without a lap belt can result in a severe neck injury. You may also find the patient having um, seat belt burns. I'd rather have a seat belt burn to the upper chest and be held within that vehicle and transported to the hospital. Now in this patient, they did not wear their lap belt properly. So they, now they have that uh, burn to the abdomen but now they are also at a greater risk of developing um, internal injuries, more severe internal injuries, because that lap belt, when it strikes, it locks. 
So now it's caused severe compression to the abdominal organs. To prevent head snapping, the proper position for the car seat is to face backward and recline to a 45 degree angle. To completely avoid injury from airbag deployment, children should always be restrained in the back seat of a vehicle and not in the front passenger seat. Car seats should be fit continuing to face backward up to the point that the child is approximately 50 pounds in weight. At that point, they can then turn, have a forward facing car seat then. And also remember in your infant and children, their head is proportionally larger than their body, which means it weighs more. So they are at a greater chance of having uh, that whiplash type injury because that's the head, the head snapping forward causing a strain onto the neck. In motorcycle collisions, uh, their impacts may either be head on or angular and are more likely to involve ejection. Helmet use is also a, high, a significant factor in reducing morbidity as well as mortality in patients. Those in Florida are not required to wear their helmet. Um, the reason being is if they are having to be thrown from the bike, with that helmet on, it is at a greater chance of assisting and preventing them from having a severe head injury. Laying the bike down is an evasive action on the part of the rider designed to prevent ejection and separation of the driver from the bike in an impending collision. The bike is turned sideways and laid down with the driver's inside leg dragging on the pavement or ground. The driver tends to lose speed faster than the bike, thus moving the bike out from under the driver. Abrasions can range from superficial abrasions involving only the epidermis to full thickness abrasions which extend through the subcutaneous tissue and in severe cases to the covering over the bone. Abrasions can be complicated by particles embedded into the tissue such as dirt, grass, or asphalt. The incidence of morbidity and mortality are greatly affected by whether the rider is wearing a helmet. boots, leather clothing, and a helmet can help to protect against soft tissue damage such as road rash and against head and facial injuries. ATVs, that's something that you're going to see common around, definitely around this area. Just like a motor vehicle, motorcycle, we are to treat our third type of collisions are similar to those. Um, the these ATVs, whether it's a four-wheeler, dirt, well, um, a quad or whatever, these are vehicles are very unstable and can be tipped very easily. These are can cause potential multiple injuries due to the combination of high speed that tend to be used with these, as well as that instability. One of the more common things that you will see in the field is falls. Now the falls have, just like with motor vehicle accidents, they have various variables, they have a variety of variables that can determine the severity of trauma, such as the distance, surface, and the body part that impacted first. Internal organ damage is very frequent in falls and you should have a high index of suspicion regardless of how the patient looks initially. The pattern of trauma injuries also depends on the body part that impacted first. A severe fall is any fall that greater than 20 feet in an adult or greater than 10 feet or 2 to 3 times the height of the child. A feet first landing causes energy to travel up the skeletal system. Fractures of the heels and fractures or dislocations of the ankles are common in feet first falls. If the knees are flexed at the time of impact, most energy is dissipated at the knees and prefers the, preserves the rest of the skeletal system. 
However, if the person lands flat-footed with knees locked, energy is transmitted up through the femurs to the hips and pelvis, possibly causing fractures. In falls of more than 20 feet, the internal organs are likely to be injured as well due to deceleration forces. The liver, spleen, kidney, aorta, and heart could potentially be affected. So as they fall, their feet hit first. So those injuries to the calcaneus are highly more are more likely. And that energy is continued to move up as it's dissipated throughout. So you may even have compression fractures to the spine as well. In head first falls, the pattern of injury begins with the arms uh, because the person will try to put their arms up to catch and extends up to the shoulders. The head could be uh, hyperextended forcibly, hyperflexed, or even compressed, all of which could potentially cause extensive damage to the cervical spine. You may also have injuries to the chest and pelvis as well as that energy continues to be go through the body as well as the body collapsing to the ground. Penetrating injuries are caused by any object that could potentially penetrate the surface of the body, such as bullets, darts, nails, and knives. The amount of damage that results depends on the amount of kinetic energy transferred to the tissue and the area of the body it penetrates. Kinetic en or penetrating injuries are broken up into low, medium, and high velocity injuries. Low velocity would be your stabbing, knives. Medium velocity would be handguns, and high velocity would be your rifles. The amount of kinetic energy transferred to the tissue is the greatest indicator for potential damage. For example, if the object is a knife, that low kinetic energy limits the damage to just the immediate site of impact and the underlying tissues. The higher the kinetic energy of a bullet results in tissue damage extending relatively far from the side of impact. If the kinetic energy produced by the bullet is totally absorbed by the body tissues, the bullet will not exit. If kinetic energy remains within the bullet, however, you are more likely to have that exit wound. As that high velocity, high energy bullet comes through, you have a large area of tissue destruction or cavitation. You may also have a shattered bone occurrence as well if that bullet goes through the bone. Low velocity, which is those knife's injuries. You may also have um, defensive wounds that be, if, they, if the patient that was stabbed is trying to block themselves, you might have those defensive wounds to the forearms. You also want to look at the length of the knife. A person stabbed from behind in the upper left chest, for example, with a short 3-inch paring knife may suffer a pneumothorax. Or if stabbed with an 8-inch knife, the injuries can include lacerated pulmonary veins, lacerated aorta, and even laceration to the heart itself. Shotgun wounds differ significantly from rifle or handgun wounds because shotguns have multiple pellets that spray in a pattern. These multiple pellets increase the impact surface area, thus increasing the amount of energy transferred to the tissues. Close range shotgun wounds can cause devastating tissue damage. With Medium and high velocity injuries, you have damage that is determined not only by the trajectory as well as dissipation of energy. The trajectory is the path or motion of a projectile during its travel, whereas dissipation of energy is the way energy is transferred to the human body from the force acting upon it. Dissipation of energy can be affected by a variety of factors, such as drag, which is the factors that slow a bullet down, such as wind resistance, constitutes drag. 
The profile is the impact point of the bullet as it is its profile. The greater the size of the impact point, the more energy is transferred. Sometimes called pathway expansion, cavitation is the cavity in the body tissues formed by a pressure wave resulting from the kinetic energy of the bullet. Cavitation greatly extends the tissue damage beyond the initial bullet pathway. That is, the hole created in the tissues is larger than the diameter of the bullet. Blown out tissue caused by cavitation and carried along with the bullet explains why the exit wound is always larger than the entry wound. Fragmentation, which is a, uh, as the bullet is going through, it breaks up into smaller pieces or, and releases small pieces uh, upon impact into the body damage. These fragments increase the frontal impact area and create greater tissue damage with injuries spread over a larger area of the body. 90% of fatal wounds involves the head, thorax, and abdomen. With the head, um, there's no room for expansion. So there's, as the bullet goes through, there's no room for that energy to expand. Um, to the face, usually it's, it causes major soft tissue damage that immediately potentially damages the airway, or threatens the airway, excuse me. Lung tissue, this is usually very, re relatively tolerant to cavitation caused by projectiles because the, the alveoli is easily movable. However, the pneumothorax that could potentially, that results from the injury to the chest and or lung is allowing air to build within the chest cavity causing the chest now the lungs now no longer able to expand but not allowing blood to escape into or blood to be able to circulate so you may have air and or blood uh, going into the th pleural cavity excuse me the abdomen is also secondarily injured when the chest is injured. The cavity is large and contains structures that are fluid filled, air filled, solid and bony. The air filled and fluid filled structures are more tolerant of cavitation than the solid organs. Blast injuries occur because of explosions from various situations such as those including natural gas, gasoline, fireworks, IEDs and grain elevators. Regardless of the cause, every explosion has four phases. The primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, and quinary phases. Now the primary ones, the primary, secondary, and tertiary are caused give me one second. Okay. Um now the primary phase injuries are due to the pressure wave of the blast. These injuries, whoops, excuse me. These injuries primarily affect the gas containing organs such as the lungs, stomach, intestines, middle and inner ears and sinuses. Severe damage and death can occur from this phase without any external sign of injury. So this is just from that pressure wave. The secondary phase um, is due to flying debris being propelled by the force of the blast. In contrast to the injuries in the primary phase, the injuries of this phase are obvious. Most common are lacerations, impaled objects, fractures, and burns. Tertiary phase injuries occur when the patient is thrown away from the source of the blast. Injuries are the same as would be expected from injection from a vehicle. The pattern depends on the distance thrown and the point of impact. Quaternary and quinary phase injuries result from the structural collapse of the, if they were in a building, as well as exposure to possible chemicals, toxins, bacteria, metals, and radiation. Approximately 90% of trauma patients have a simple or single injury that involves only one body system, such as a fractured tibia or a soft tissue laceration with no major bleeding. A multi-system trauma patient has multiple injuries or involvement of more than one body system. 
The body system can include the central nervous, pulmonary, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, urinary, reproductive, musculoskeletal, and integumentary systems. Multiple organ injuries are multi-system trauma, even though they may be part of the same body system, such as the small intestine or the liver. The golden period was once referred to as the golden hour. However, some injured patients require definitive care in less than an hour to survive, whereas some patients can survive if care is provided beyond one hour. Some EMS systems refer to the platinum 10 minutes. This means that in cases of severe trauma, 10 minutes is the maximum time the EMS team should devote to on-scene activities. With patient assessment, emergency care for life threats, and preparation for transport all being accomplished within 10 minutes of arriving on scene. If a patient is not severely injured or is with no life-threatening conditions, more time can and should be devoted to completing normal on-scene assessment and emergency care before transport is undertaken. The key is determining whether the patient is or is not severely injured. It is to the patient's potential benefit to err on the side of overestimating rather than underestimating the extent or severity of injuries. The harm that can be done by delaying transport when it is needed outweighs the good that can be done by completing on-scene assessment and care at a more deliberate, deliberate pace. Now, the trauma system is designed to provide immediate surgical intervention for patients with internal trauma if necessary. Extensive, intensive care services specific to trauma and rehabilitation services. Now, there are multiple levels of trauma centers, and each level has uh, its own level of capability. The care that they could provide dramatically reduces the chances uh, reduces the morbidity and mortality of patient requiring immediate surgical intervention. Now the trauma system requires significant resources and is expensive to maintain and operate. Hospitals with certain recognized capabilities are part of this trauma system and are recognized as trauma centers. Level 4, I'm going to start from the bottom work our way up. Level 4 trauma facilities are typically your small community hospitals in remote areas capable of stabilizing seriously injured trauma patients and then transferring them to a higher level trauma center. Um, these such as, let's see around here, this would be like your stat meds, prime cares, um, something like that. Level 3 or your community trauma centers, they have some surgical capability and specially trained ED personnel to manage trauma. This type of center focuses on stabilizing the seriously injured trauma patient and then transferring them to a higher level center, such as uh, Dell Medical Center would be a level three facility. Enterprise Medical Center would be a level three. Level two area trauma centers, these, patient, these can manage the vast majority of trauma with surgical capabilities 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are capable of, of stabilizing more specialized trauma patients and then transferring them to a level 1 center. Southeast Medical Center would be a level 2 trauma center. Level 1 or your regional trauma centers, these can manage all and any type of trauma 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Um, UAB would be a level 1 trauma center. It is crucial that EMS personnel triage patients accurately for transport to an appropriate trauma center. This guideline that, is, that you see here is the criteria regarding transport of trauma patients to an appropriate trauma facility as developed by the Centers for Disease Control. Now the golden principles of pre-hospital trauma care apply to all patients who have experienced any type of injury, 
is but especially those with multi-system trauma or critical injuries. These principles are to ensure at all times your safety and quickly determining the need for additional resources at the scene. Quickly and effectively managing the airway and ventilating your patient. Any significant bleeding to stop it. And assessing the trauma patient in a systematic sequence. If the patient is losing a significant amount of blood, the delivery of oxygen and glucose to the cells is impaired. Um, with the Golden Principles, there are some special considerations, such as rapidly transporting your patient being essential to the survival of your patient. Because the definitive care for many of these patients is surgery. If they are critical, try to get them uh, en route within 10 minutes of on scene. If they, and rapid extrication should be used to remove the patient from a vehicle. Do en route, that's when you can do your assessment, further assessment. Stabilizing fractures if time permit and condition permits. And don't develop t tunnel vision. For example, a humeral fracture with a bone protruding from the skin at a 90 degree angle will attract your attention. However, if the patient is alert and screaming in pain, you must assume that he has an adequate amount of energy, good perfusion, and an adequate amount of oxygen and glucose delivered to the cells. On the other hand, the patient sitting next to him who barely nods his head in response to your question of, are you okay, likely is lacking energy from inadequate perfusion and should be treated first. Alright guys, that concludes for this chapter. Make sure that you are working on your Brady Labs. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to either email me or send me a message and remind. Or make sure you write it down and we will talk about it next time when we are in class. Um, otherwise, I will see you all next time. Y'all have a good rest of your day.